warnings mount over right-wing plot to rewrite U.S. Constitution. Taliban and United States swap prisoners. Israel arrests director of Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque. Six children killed in army airstrike on school in Burma. Muslim homebuyers in Canada flock to halal financing options. Smartwatches can save your life. From our Chicago studios, this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Samana Siddiqui. Our top story tonight, U.S. government watchdogs warn the Republican takeover of state legislatures in recent years could have major implications for the United States. A right-wing push to hold a new constitutional convention seems closer than ever before to being realized. In an op-ed published in The Guardian on Monday, former Democratic U.S. Senator Russ Feingold wrote that Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution allows the document to be amended. That can be done with amendments proposed by two-thirds of Congress and ratified by three-quarters of the states. It can also be done through the establishment of a new constitutional convention. To hold a new convention, two-thirds of all state legislatures, 34 in total, must apply to hold the gathering. Feingold was the only U.S. senator in 2001 to vote against the Patriot Act. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, that law resulted in numerous violations of civil liberties, including greater surveillance of American citizens. In the early morning hours of May 21, 2017, 23-year-old U.S. Army Lieutenant Richard Collins III was murdered by a white supremacist. At 3 a.m., Collins, who was black, was stabbed to death at a bus stop by a member of the Alt-Reich Nation. Collins was set to graduate from the historically black Bowie State University. He had just completed airborne training and was supposed to start active duty in seven days. Since his murder, Collins' parents have spent years imploring the Department of Defense, Veterans Administration, Army Secretary, and Arlington National Cemetery to let their only son be buried among the historic graves. They have been refused because Collins had not started on active duty. Arlington National Cemetery only buries active duty members. Collins' case has sparked a debate over what constitutes active duty when confronted with domestic terrorism. U.S. President Joe Biden announced the release of American prisoner Mark Fryricks after two and a half years in Taliban captivity. Biden said the Navy veteran's release was the culmination of years of tireless work by dedicated public servants. Fryricks was abducted in January 2020 while he was working in Afghanistan as a civil engineer. He was released in exchange for Haji Bashar Nurzai, a Taliban ally who was sentenced to life in prison on drug charges. Afghan Foreign Minister Amir Khan Muttaqi said Nurzai was held at the U.S. military prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. But a senior Biden administration official rebutted the suggestion. Nurzai was arrested in 2005 by federal agents in New York City. This was after he was designated among the most prolific drug traffickers in the world. Turkish First Lady Amin Erdogan received an award Sunday in New York City from a leading Muslim coalition for her humanitarian efforts. Erdogan was honored with the Outstanding Humanitarian Award during a ceremony organized by the U.S. Council for Muslim Organizations. Five other Muslim women received the Outstanding Achievement Award. This was for their work in science, women's empowerment, journalism, and COVID-19 response. Erdogan said Turkey is continuing its humanitarian aid on a bilateral level with nations and also through the U.N. It dispersed over $7 billion in aid to 122 countries, including Syria, Somalia, and Palestine in 2021. Israeli police detained the director of Al-Aqsa Mosque in East Jerusalem and later released him on Monday, eyewitnesses report. Israeli forces raided Sheikh Omar al-Kiswani's home in the city's Atur neighborhood earlier that day. They confiscated a computer and a number of documents. Israeli police released al-Kiswani without specifying the reason for his detention. Al-Kiswani has been detained several times before by Israeli police for the intelligence service. On Saturday, Israeli public broadcaster KAN said Israeli authorities decided to deport a number of Palestinians from Al-Aqsa Mosque in preparation for the Jewish holidays. Al-Aqsa Mosque is the world's third holiest site for Muslims. Jews call the area the Temple Mount, claiming it is the site of two Jewish temples in ancient times. Six children killed in an army airstrike on a school in Burma. Details after the break, so stay tuned. And we'll be right back after these messages. A free 
three-minute online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Rise up. I'm gonna make a difference. Rise up. Take back what's mine. Rise up. Give power to the people. Rise up. Some dreams never die. Rise up. Can I get a witness? Rise up. You know that it's right. Rise up. We gotta rise up, rise up. and teach the world. Welcome back. At least six children were killed and 17 others wounded as helicopters belonging to Burma's army opened fire on a school in Sagang City. According to Mizima and Irrawaddy news websites, army helicopters fired on the school located in a Buddhist monastery in the Letyet Kone area. State media claimed the military opened fire because armed groups were using the building to attack its forces. Residents said the bodies were transported by the military to a town about six miles away and buried. Lebanese group Hezbollah has threatened to target the offshore Karish gas field amid a maritime border dispute with Israel. Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah said Israeli officials initially said extraction from Karish would happen in September, but later postponed it. Nasrallah said Hezbollah is closely following up on the border demarcation negotiations between Lebanon and Israel. He warned our missiles are locked on Karish as long as the extraction hasn't begun. The group has pledged not to allow oil and gas to be extracted from the disputed Kaddish field before Lebanon's demands are met. Energy exploration company Energine has postponed its activity in the disputed Kaddish field for a few weeks without providing details. U.S. mediator Amos Hochstein was optimistic about reaching a border demarcation agreement between Lebanon and Israel soon. A film about a man trying to save his seven grandchildren from an ISIS camp in Syria took the top prize at the 5th Al Jazeera Balkans International Documentary Film Festival. The festival was held in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, from September 9th to 13th. Gorky Glasser Mueller's documentary Children of the Enemy received the AJB Main Award. Julie Bezerra Madsen's documentary All That Remains to Be Seen won the AJB Special Jury Award. Pitar Trista's A Park Life and Mark Weiss's This Stolen Country of Mine also received awards. Festival director Edhem Foko said tickets were sold out and people showed interest in these issues. A House Made of Splinters by Simon Lareg Wilmont, No Place Like Home by Emily Beck, and Celebrity Untold, Miroslav Siroblazevich by Irina Skorchik were also screened as part of the closing program. Azerbaijan's foreign ministry lodged a complaint with the French envoy in the capital Baku. This was over recent attacks by what it described as radical Armenian groups on its embassy in Paris. French ambassador to Azerbaijan Zachary Gross was summoned to the ministry following the attacks on Sunday. Azerbaijan's deputy foreign minister Khalaf Khalafov told the ambassador about a demonstration of brutal violations of French law and international legal norms by a group of radical extremist groups of the Armenian diaspora. The embassy building was damaged during the attack, according to the statement. The ministry demanded an investigation into the act of vandalism, which endangered the diplomatic mission and its staff. It urged French law enforcement agencies to bring the guilty parties to justice and provide compensation for damages. 
While Canada's housing market is in retreat, in some provinces, demand for home loans by Muslim home buyers is booming, as are halal financing options. More than a million Canadians identify as Muslim. They are disproportionately renters, and many feel shut out of the real estate market. That's because observant Muslims are prohibited from paying or receiving interest, which prevents them from taking conventional mortgages. A new startup, Canadian Halal Financial Corp., is trying to meet the demand for Muslim home ownership in Edmonton, Alberta. The company was founded by Thomas Lukashuk, a former provincial MLA and cabinet minister, and John Stainton, a businessman and lawyer. The two have worked closely with Edmonton's Al Rashid Mosque to create an alternate type of mortgage they say meets strict religious standards. The company has approved 600 applications since its launch last December, with more than a dozen new requests weekly. Pakistan is refusing to hand over a retired army general to the International Tribunal of Hague on medical grounds, official sources told the Express Tribune. The tribunal had demanded the custody of former chief of the Inter-Services Intelligence, Javed Nasser, a retired lieutenant general. Nasser allegedly supported Muslim fighters of Bosnia against the Serbian army in the 1990s, despite an arms embargo by the United Nations. The court summons came when Serbian army officials were put on trial by the Hague Tribunal for war crimes and crimes against humanity in Bosnia. During the trial, it was revealed that Nasser was actively involved in the war and had supported and provided arms to the Bosnian resistance. Smartwatches are used to manage health, including counting steps and monitoring sleep, but they can also save lives. Several popular smartwatches now detect atrial fibrillation, or AFib, the most common type of irregular heartbeat and a leading cause of strokes. AFib can cause palpitations, shortness of breath, or fatigue. The symptoms aren't always obvious. Smartwatches can now catch AFib before the person even knows something is wrong. Dr. Erica D. Engelstein, an electrophysiologist at Rush Oak Park Hospital in Chicago, said smartwatches can now detect AFib very accurately. They are right about 90% of the time. The FDA has approved the use of the Apple Watch and the Samsung Galaxy for AFib detection, she said. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment, so stay tuned, and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a mile, mile in my shoes. shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. They took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org caregiving. Billboards are popping up all over the country with an... Our neighbors don't realize that Muslims are absolutely opposed to ISIS. Salam. My name is Abdul Malik Mujahid. I'm an Imam in Chicago. 16 shots! No me! No justice! No me! So how do we bring up the energy which uh, can really have an impact on the world? You need to build bridges of understanding among people and we need to have America moving forward. That lesson learned has brought the strength of humanity to America, which is the diversity. Mujahid Talks, only on Muslim Network TV. Faithfully Connected. Assalamu alaikum! 
love Adam's world because it makes me learn in a fun way. That Adam has green, a green face and um, orange hair. I like this song. I like how Adam sings. No. 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 And here's Adam and here's Anissa. Adam is and his sister. And Adam is a boy and he is very small. Download the new Adam's World app at adamsworldapp.com and let's help tomorrow's Muslims today. Welcome back. President Biden has honored Madison resident Masood Akhtar for his decades-long work combating hate against the Muslim community. To discuss this in detail, let's go to Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid. Over to you, Imam Mujahid. Thank you, Samana. Hate is rising around the world, but right here around our neighborhood in America. Not only hate is rising, partisanship has reached the level people are not listening to each other. In churches, people don't face each other on these issues. At the top of it, people are purchasing guns. My mechanic was saying that, hey, not only I have a license, but my mother does and my sister does. The problem is there is not enough ammunition available because people are grabbing. So there is a quota, how much ammunition you can buy per week. What is happening to our country? In this situation, there are people who are concerned about them. And President Biden gathered them in the White House for a summit called United We Stand. One of the person who attended was also honored there. He was one of the two Muslims honored uh, at that summit, uh, Masood Akhtar from Wisconsin. Welcome to Muslim Network TV and Assalamu Alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam and thanks for inviting me. Really appreciate it. So, uh, Masood Akhtar Sahib, you, you were among the 16 leaders and activists recognized at the United We Stand Summit. Tell us first about the summit, what it was, and then I will ask you, what did you do to be counted that way? Yeah. So, it was a very exciting moment. Literally there it was an all day event. And, uh, you know, President Biden was our keynote speaker, Vice President Kamala Harris was there and the Secretary Department of Homeland Security, um, Attorney General, and also Ambassador Susan Rice, he's the lead on this. We were all there together. And it was very really enlightening because what is needed in this country really is unity. And if you think about it, the purpose of this particular event was unity. United, we stand. The other major focus was we can never achieve unity in this country until and unless we bring elected officials of both parties and all the stakeholders together. And then there was a real life stories of people that got very emotional. These are the people who lost their sons, daughters, mother, you name it. They all came and shared their story. So the message that I got out of the White House after attending this all day event was that it's time to work together in a bipartisan way. And this was the first step in the right direction. And they recognized several people from the country. And uh, luckily I was one of them, those people who have been actively, actually engaged in their local communities to combat this rising hate, particularly that is against minorities, including Muslims. So uh, share with us, uh, what work do you do? I mean, I'd like to congratulate you on your reward, 
but uh, share with our audience the type of things which you do to bring uh, love instead of haste to rise. Yeah. Um, so back in 2016, there was a local TV station who called me and I was very busy overcoming this 9-11 perception of Muslims. People have a lot of misconception about Islam and Muslims in this country. So with my community, I was organizing events to overcome those perceptions. So 2016, I got a call from local TV station that there is now a discussion in the White House about starting a Muslim registry in United States. And that was very shocking to me because United States is not Germany. Hitler started that registry for Jewish people. So I got on television and didn't know how I'm going to respond. So when the question was asked, my response was that, hey, I came to this country 36 years ago at that time, and 25 years ago, I gave up my Indian citizenship based on what this country offers. Singling out a minority based on religion is not what America is all about. It's going to divide the country based on religion. And then a thought came to my mind and I said, but I like the idea of starting a registry that will actually bring people together regardless of their ethnicity, color, religion or no religion or political affiliation. So on your show, I said, I'm going to start a movement called Anti-Hate Registry, and which now we call, we are many united against hate. What we do through this movement, which is a nonpartisan nonprofit, we have really live stories of people who have been from the former hate groups. They lived that life, they recruited people to kill people, now their life completely changed. So as a part of educational program, I take them to schools and communities and ask them to share the live stories that resonate with a lot of people. Second thing is I'm targeting a lot of these youth. So two or three of schools, middle schools and high schools, started chapters of We Are Many United Against Hate, and these students become ambassador of We Are Many United Against Hate on my board, and they organize events actually in their schools and classrooms and communities. Now I have five international chapters, people who came here, listened to my message, and they decided to actually start chapters overseas. So this movement in a very short period of time really became an international movement. And because of its positive impact, the organization received FBI National Award, Governor's Award, and uh, Southern Poverty Law Center Award. So the impact is pretty substantial and that's what I'm trying to focus on it. And that's how I was recognized for starting this movement that has such a positive impact. Which other countries do you have chapters? So right now there are three chapters in Africa, one in Albania, and other one is in UK. And the reason these chapters started because US Department of State in June this year reached out to me and they said, we have delegates from African countries, European countries and Middle East countries. We would like to send them to Madison and you can organize the events the way you organize and then listen to how we in this country are dealing with this rising hate. So they all came, uh, one group came uh, in the first week of June, second, the last week of June, and then they learned. And the impact was so huge that when I talked to these people after the left, they said, after listening to you, after listening the way you are dealing with, the life completely changed. So that resulted into me creating an international advisory board member. So that has about 12 or 13 leaders from these countries. Out of that effort, they wanted to do similar things in their schools, so they started chapters at their school uh, in partnership with us. So tell me this, you have heritage from India 
And India at this moment uh, is quite conflicted. I mean, it's no longer India of Gandhi. It, it has uh, become a very problematic country. People are giving open calls for genocide to kill 2 million Muslims. So the other 200 million will run away and all sort of crazy stuff. And these are religious leaders who are doing that. So are you thinking of starting a chapter there as well? Yeah. And so I'm in conversation with some of those people as well, um, because, you know, India <laughs> at this point is really following what's happening in our country here in America. And which is very, very unfortunate. You know, at one time, India was the leading democracy and everybody was respected and everybody was treated properly and all of those things. But in the last several years, things have changed significantly. So when I'm talking to leaders from India, I am bringing some of these concerns to their attention. You know, when uh, Prime Minister Modi was elected, I wrote an article at that time, and I talked about that Modi is Donald Trump of India. And that is very true in terms of what's happening. But just like in United States, majority of people are good people regardless of who they are. India is a similar situation. You know, I talked to a lot of Hindu people here in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, they respect when we sit down, we talk about it. So it's still a, a small percentage of people. Most of those are highly uneducated. So I think they need something like that where we can sit down because I still believe that education and engagement is a key. Number two things that I also see is similar situation in the United States. You know, you think about, you always remember 9-11, what happened. The day 9-11 happened in the United States, the next day, all Republicans and all Democrats came together to fight this international terrorism. Just keep that in mind. If you look at what happened on January 6, did we see the same response? Did all these both parties came together to fight this? Did they condemn the same way as they did when there was international attack? Did they call this as a domestic terrorism? None of that. And so that's where we are struggling with. And that's what I said, why I was motivated when I came from the White House their message was very clear. We are here to help, but we cannot fight this fight on our own. We need the other party to work together. And that's why when New York shooting took place, I issued a national call of unity. And I asked the local government, the state government, and the federal government to start a bipartisan unity caucus where we ask these elected officials of both parties to chair those caucuses and get all the stakeholders actually to work together and take more proactive approach to make sure that this country remain united and similar things have to happen in India or any other country that is struggling with this kind of division. So if you have to keep this country united, there is no way out other than education and bringing the parties together. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Masood Akhtar, for your work, and congr congratulations for your award, and hope you will continue the good work which you do. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Your media is always a part of my village. You promote it. That's the way to deal with this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum as -salam. Back to you, Samana. Thank you. That's all from our Chicago studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Salam and good night.